I want to ask Colleen how to get your email off of how that I don't mean. Oh. The Pashas Pekude, Elu Pekude Ha Mishkan Mishkan. It's a double language Mishkan Mishkan. Rashi says, Shtei Pa'amim, Remez Le Migdash, Shenishmas Nismashkein, Bishnei Churbanim, Ala Vonoseim Shal Yisrael. So the Mishkan becomes a Mashkan. And the Chazal are playing on that word. Mashkon Mishkan. Mashkon means a collateral. So Rashi says that the reason why it says Mishkan twice is to allude to the fact that there'll be two Batim and Dachos, both of them will be destroyed. And that was taken as a Mashkon for the sins of Klal Yisrael. But uh, the obvious question is, why should the, the Mishkan, which is the Mokom of Shechino, why should that be destroyed because of the sins of Klal Yisrael? And there's such profanity in the Migdash. For example, the Gemara in Gitin on Daf Nun Vav, Omen Beis, tells us about Titus, right, who took a zona and he entered into the Kodesh Kadoshim and he engaged in all that promiscuity in the Kodesh Kadoshim. Let's suggest the following approach, that when Klai Yisrael sinned at the time of the Churban, the sins were so severe that Akash Baruch Hu really, Alpi Mishpat, was determined to destroy Hashem, the Jewish nation. And the Beis Amigdash was taken as a substitute. Hashem had two choices. He could either destroy Kalal Yisrael and save the Migdash, or destroy the Migdash and save Kalal Yisrael. And in that sense, the Migdash was the Kapara Hindal, the Sarel Azazel, to atone for Klal Yisrael. And all this desecration that we mentioned, for example, Titus, all this humiliation of the Migdash was absolutely necessary. It would not have been enough to just simply destroy the Migdash. The Migdash had to be humiliated. And if it wasn't that it was humiliated, then the Klal Yisrael would have, been, would have been completely destroyed. So that's the idea of a mashko. The mashko means, if I don't collect from you, I collect from the mashko. So HaKadosh Baruch would have collected from Klal Yisrael and destroyed them, and instead he collected from the mashko, which is the base on Migdosh. And this is called, in the language of Chazal, Hotzi es kaso ala eitzim balavonit. That God so to speak, meted out his anger, instead of destroying Klal Yisrael, he burnt the Eitzim Vavon of the Mikdash. And there seems to be a commensurate relationship with, between sin and the level of sin and the humiliation and the level thereof in the base of Mikdash. The more severe the sin, the greater the destruction of the Mikdash and the humiliation of the Mikdash. So that in effect, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu chooses to destroy the Migdash instead of Klal Yisrael, it's actually an act of chesed and compassion from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Because basically God was saying, I will not destroy the congregation of Israel, instead I will destroy the Beis HaMikdash. And the decision was that the Beis HaMikdash be destroyed, but not the people of Israel. That's a great chesed for Klal Yisrael, so the Klal Yisrael could continue to exist. And that's the double language of Mishkan here at the beginning of Pashat Kudai. Hashem decides that in this choice, it's more important that Klal Yisrael survive than the Beis HaMikdash survive, because the Beis HaMikdash is Eitzim Vavon. It's at the end of the day, it's wood, it's stones, it's inanimate objects. And the Gemara tells us that a Talmud Chacham is more important than 500 Bate Migdash. Imagine 500 Bate Migdash. 
one Talmud Chacham in his life is more important and outweighs 500 Bate Migdash. Now, I'm not sure why Chazal focused on the number 500, but there must be a deeper meaning to that. But in any event, the base of Migdash was completely destroyed, but the people would survive. And that means that the potential is there for a recreation of the base of Migdash. If Klal Yisrael would have been destroyed, there would be no possibility of rebuilding the Migdash. But since Klal Yisrael survived, then that's a sign of optimism and hope that there will be a replacement base of Migdash. As long as Klal Yisrael is still alive, then the base of Migdash we know will be rebuilt. And now I want to mention to you a sugi in the Gemara and Tainus on Daf Test. Titus goes into the Migdash. He sets fire to the Migdash. He destroys it late in the afternoon of Tishab, of the flames, continue to consume the base of Migdash well into the 10th of Tishab. Of and this was the greatest manifestation of Midas Hadid, of harsh judgment. So why do we need chesed? And the answer is, from the perspective of Midas Hadin, it's not enough to destroy the mashkon, meaning the mishkon, in order to justify sparing the people. Their sins were so severe, they destroyed, destroyed, deserved destruction, and even the destruction of the Mikdash would not be enough, based on Midas Hadin. It's only because HaKadosh Baruch Hu personifies and manifest himself in Midas Arachamim, that's why Klal Yisrael were able to survive. And the truth is that if you imagine what was like on Tisha B'Av itself, nobody really knew, not even the Malachim, whether HaKadosh Baruch Hu would be destroying his people or he would substitute the Beis HaMikdash in their stead. After Mincha, on the ninth of Av, HaKadosh Baruch Hu finally decided to take the Mishkan, meaning to collect from the collateral. And in the late afternoon, HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided that the Beis HaMikdash should be destroyed, the people would survive. Titus took a, a torch, set fire to the Beis HaMikdash, and Klal Yisrael understood that HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided to take the Eitzim Vavanim, the stones and the wood of the Beis HaMikdash and spare the people of Israel. The wood would burn, but the human beings and their neshamos would continue to remain. Their souls would remain. And that's why we recite Kinnis basically in the morning of Tishma, but not in the afternoon of Tishma. In the afternoon of Tishbav, we're going to recite Nachem in Shmon Esri of Min. And the reason for the Nechama is that the very moment that Kodesh Baruch Hu made the final decision to take the, the Mashkon, take the Beis HaMikdash, in that late afternoon on Tishbav, when God made that decision, the Beis HaMikdash would be destroyed, the Jewish people would survive. And Titus took a torch and set fire to the Beis HaMikdash, Klal Yisrael understood that HaKadosh Baruch decided to take the building, take the Eitzim upon him, and spare Klal Yisrael. So the Klal Yisrael would continue, and there would be optimism and faith that eventually we would return and rebuild the Migdash. So wood will burn, but the soul will remain. And that's why we say Nachem, in Mincha on Tisha B'av, in the second part of the day, in the afternoon, because at that point we could have Nechama, we could have a sense of consolation, because we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu allowed Titus to set torch to the base of Migdash and destroy it, and that meant that Klal Yisrael decided to spare Klal Yisrael, to save the people of Israel. And so you would have thought that since Titus set fire to the base of Migdash, we should have the most intense mourning and grief 
And yet, all of a sudden, we let up on the morning of the grief. We sit on chairs, and we don't, with no recitation of kidneys. We put on a talus and tefillin, and we recite Nachem and Shmonos. So this hakala, in which the avelus of Churban Abayas is diminished, is diluted, diluted, this is a result of God's decision to burn the Mesa English down. Paradoxical. It's counterintuitive. But once the Beis HaMikdash was set on fire, there was no longer a threat to the existence of Klal Yisrael. And therefore the Avelus becomes less severe, less intense. Such an irony, the burning of the Beis HaMikdash is, is in itself the, the demonstration that Jewish na nationhood would survive, that there would always be a Yeshua for Klal You know, it's really interesting when you think about it. We have Tariq mitzvahs. And if one is remiss with regard to one mitzvah, that doesn't exclude him in any way from another mitzvah. So, for example, a person would put on tzitzis but not fill in. We're not going to take away from him the ability to put on fill in. And he'll do tshuva, hopefully, and he'll put on tefillin. But in the case of the Beis HaMikdash, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says that the community is guilty of the most severe sins, and therefore our rights to the Beis HaMikdash are forfeited. As a result, of course, we cannot fulfill a host a myriad of mitzvahs, including karbonos. And that makes absolutely sense that you are guilty of the most severe crimes, the Gimel Averis Kamuros, in the case of Baisman. And now you want to be makriv karbonos? Akkadish Baruch Hu says, you have violated the Torah on such a profound level that I will destroy the base on me. And on the one hand, it's a terrible thing because without the base on me, we're lacking so many, so many mitzvahs and so many, so many karbonos. But on the other hand, it is a time of simcha, of hakola samvilis. And that's because. Hotzi is castle. I'll eat him. I want to fast forward now to Pasuk Chavches. I will read it in both the Hebrew and the English. Mesha Elef Ushva Meos Vechamisha Veshivim Asar Vavin Laamud. We're talking about 1,775. And what happens? We have 1,775 shkolim. And out of these shkolim, he makes hooks. The Gemara says in Bechoros that there's a conversation 
between a non-Jewish officer and Rabbi Yochum and Zaka. The officer argues that Moshe was not precise in his accounting. Because if each of the 603, 550 Israelites would give a half a shekel of silver, there would be over 200 shekels of silver, yet Moshe Rabbeinu used less than half, 100 kikrit to make the silver sockets for the Mishkan. We'll get to that soon. And Rabbi Yochanan Zakai says that Moshe used the remainder, whatever he had left over, he used it to make the hooks. There's a tremendous emphasis here on details. You know, the non-Jewish world always criticized the Jewish world. Why are you so hung up on details? They seem so pedantic. I once approached a college president on behalf of an Orthodox student who needed to have an, an exam rescheduled so he would not violate the Shabbos or Yom the president asked, why could I not grant the student a one-time dis dispensation? And he was wondering why we should invest so much time and effort on these halachic minutia. Just give him a dispensation that this time he doesn't have to pay the shkola, the maksa shekel. So getting back to our question as to why the significance of uh, attributed to these tiny hooks, Chazal tell us in the Yalkut, that Moshe was initially, he lost track of those hooks. Till HaKadosh Baruch, who enlightened Moshe's eyes, showed him the hooks, illuminated like stars in the sky. And Moshe realized that without the hooks, the sockets could not structurally bear the, the weight of the Mishkan. Without the small details, the fundamental principles would have been lost and long disappeared. So we see over and over again that the Torah puts so much emphasis on details. Here in our parish on the hooks, and it seems so banal, you know, so uh, mundane, and yet the Torah is putting such emphasis on it. Asher Tziva Hashem is Moshe. This is in Perek, Lamites, Pasuk Beit. Well, the, I should say the end of Pasuk now. When the Jewish people built the golden calf, the Egel Hasov, they were longing and searching and thirsting for a deity. What does that mean? They thought that Moshe was gone. And Moshe was the hook that connected them to the Almighty on high. Now that Moshe Rabbeinu is gone, then a 
like the hooks, if you take them out, the sockets could not structurally bear the weight of the mishkan. Okay. Now, instead of the Egel Azov, we have the Mishkan. The Mishkan is meant to be a kapora for the Egel Azov. And the Pesach says, Kashat Tziva Hashem is Moshe. Every detail, every minutia, every article of the Mishkan was assembled and put into place and affirmed by Moshe Rabbeinu, one after the other, Kashat Tziva Hashem is Moshe. 